Yo guys, what's going on? I'm Tim. This is the Real Sports Talk. Day 5 of, of the 30 clubs and 30 days recap. Day 1 we did the Astros. Day 2 we did the Twins. Day 3 we did the Mariners. Day 4 we did the Orioles. And then today we are doing the Padres. Now you can go to our channel. We switched to the new design finally. Uh, I honestly cannot stand the new, new design because... I thought that the other one looked a lot more professional and legit, and this one just kind of looks like YouTube's trying to make the non-partners uh, to look like YouTubers and not people that can be taken seriously. That's just my opinion. But what we did is we took the new design that shows all your uploaded videos, so you can just go to our page, youtube.com slash mrkelstar, and it's going to show you all the uploaded videos we've done over the past like, month. If you want to see even more, you can just click at the bottom where it says 2, 3, 4, and so on. You guys know how to do it, though. And uh, throughout the next few days, the teams we have coming up are the Cubs on day 6, the Royals day 7, uh, day 8 we have the Pittsburgh Pirates, and day 9 things really heat up with the Miami Marlins who look to be very interesting. Then you got the Rockies, A's, Mets, Reds, White Sox, Nationals. Stick around with us throughout this entire thing. Even if there's a stretch of teams that you are not a fan of or really could not care less of, about, every team matters because last year the Diamond, or two years ago the Diamondbacks were really not a very good team. Last year they ended up going 94 and 68 and looking like a team this year that could potentially make a run into the playoffs. So you never know what team is going to turn around. And if you're not necessarily a baseball expert, you're just a really big fan. You know, you you could be that guy that says to my friend, to says to your friends, "Yo, th this team is going to be really good this year." I heard that, and when they end up being really good, you look like a genius. So. Let me go through a few baseball news and notes real quick. A.G. Burnett, uh, MLB Trade Rumors is reporting that that deal will be done. He will go to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, for the Yankees, I still think it was worth them signing him. Why not? I mean, he got them a World Series title. He really pitched well in his first season there. And since then, he has not been good. But in the end, I'll trade a World Series title for two bad years. And they will pay about $20 million left. So for the Pirates, I like the move because you really don't have anything to lose. Second news and note is that Tim Wakefield will be retiring. Wakefield has spent 17 seasons with the Red Sox in a 19-year career, obviously most famous for his knuckleball. An incredible career. He isn't one of those type of pitchers. He's similar to Jamie Moyer, who, by the way, we might be getting an interview with. He's similar to Jamie Moyer in the stretch that, uh, or in the sense that what Jamie Moyer and him have done is they don't have great stuff. But they've worked with what they've been given and done a tremendous job. And by the way, Edwin Jackson, I know we said something about getting an interview with him of the Nationals last year. with the Cardinals when they won the World Series. He threw a no-hitter with the D-backs the other year. He's been really all around with the Rays when they won the World Series, White Sox, all around the MLB. But he's really a tremendous pitcher. He will be coming on for an interview sometime over the next week. We have heard back from him. As soon as he arrives in spring training, you will hear it here first on the Real Sports Talk Network. Uh, Edwin Jackson's thoughts on being a Washington National and what they could potentially do this season. The third is that legendary catcher, one of the, I think the top five catchers of all time, Gary Carter, had pa has passed away yesterday at the age of 57 from cancer. It it's really a sad thing to see. This guy is one of the best catchers of all time with the Mets and with the Expos. And what we so also saw is he was always in a great mood, great guy. And uh, very charismatic, and it's tough to see that happen. Baseball legends die. It's just an awful thing. We saw Harmon Killebrew last year, and then Gary Carter now. And the thing is, Gary Carter is not old. Tony Gwynn, speaking of the Padres, who we're about to get into, Tony Gwynn uh, went through surgery the other day to remove some tumor. I think it was a tumor in his mouth, and all has gone well, and it looks like he'll make a full recovery. I think it came back after... They did surgery a few years ago. Let's get into the San Diego Padres now. Bud Black, their manager, 71-91 and record last year. After the season before, when they traded away, or in the last offseason, they traded away Adrian Gonzalez. But the season before that, they had gone, I think, 92-70. and They finished one game out of the Giants, who won the division. And, and no one saw that coming. Bud Black ran away with manager of the year. And I think he's done a pretty solid job of working with a team that over the course of 
his tenure there doesn't have a ton of talent. I think the they had a tremendous offseason this year, though. They lost Heath Bell to the Marlins. That's really the one negative note. But they acquired Heath... Not Heath Bell. Houston Street from the Rocky Street uh, over the last couple of seasons has had trouble staying healthy. But when he's been healthy, he had a year there with the Rockies where he was one of the top five closers in the game. He had some success early in his career with the A's, and he is a nice piece to pick up to replace Heath Bell, who is going to be tough to replace. They traded away Matt Latos, who's still only 25 or 26, but they got a tremendous return back. Ismani Grandel, Brad Boxberger. Edison Volquez, who has struggled over the past three or four years, but throughout his career has had uh, uh, some success. I think he even made an all-star game originally. He was the main piece that was traded to the Reds for Josh Hamilton. And they also acquired Yonder Alonso, who I have been told has tremendous power and could be the next one of the next big things in the MLB. So I like the trade for both sides there, really. And they also acquired Carlos Quinton. As they like to say on baseball tonight, Carlos Quentin, who originally was with the Diamondbacks, was kind of a failed prospect there, got traded to the White Sox, had a monster year, almost won the MVP before getting injured. The next season, he belie- uh, I think it was 2010, he really had a down year. And then last year, he came back and had a pretty nice season with them. I think, yeah, let me pull it. He had 254 with 24 home runs and 77 RBIs. But in 2008... He had 288 with 36 home runs and 100 RBIs. And you're never going to convince a hitter to sign there because of the dimensions of Petco Park, even though it is one of the nicest stadiums in baseball, in my opinion. Because of the dimensions, it's tough to get a power hitter to sign there. Would I consider him an elite power hitter? No, but he's a pretty solid hitter. And if they can continue to add pieces like him, this is going to be a team that can turn itself around. Alright, so let's go in position by position about the San Diego Padres. We will start at catcher with Nick Hundley, who last season, in his fourth season with the Padres, batted 288 with 9 home runs and 29 RBIs in only 82 games. If they can get him to have more of an expanded role this season, I think that he is going to have a lot more success at age 29 now. I think that he's a pretty underrated catcher. He's not a great catcher, but he's a pretty solid catcher. They have a nice backup in John Baker, though, who in four seasons with the Mons had a combined uh, 14 home runs at 89 RBIs. He was really m- mostly a backup for them, and he struggled last year in only 16 games, hitting 154. But what I look at is 2009 in 112 games, he had 271, 9 home runs, and 50 RBIs. That's a pretty solid backup catcher. He will get, He will strike out a lot. But I like him as a backup catcher. Over at first base then, you have a few guys. And this, again, is one of those lineups where, to an average baseball fan, you're not going to be very familiar with a lot of the players. But what I would try to do is give you an understanding of how good some of these guys are going to be. And at first base, Jesus Guzman looks like he could be a pretty solid player. He came up with the Giants in 2009 and ultimately ended up with the Padres. And in 76 games last year, he hit 312 with 5 home runs and 44 RBIs. So I think that they should be pretty confident sending him out. He is 28. He's not real young for a guy that's just kind of breaking into the MLB. But he's made some really nice plays over at first base that I've seen. And obviously last year he's pretty successful hitting with this team. So I would expect that Jesus Guzman continues to make strides this year. Is he the long-term solution? Probably not. But when people say, oh, who the hell is Jesus Guzman? He's actually a pretty good player. Back him up, you have Yonder Alonso, who we mentioned. Uh, Not a ton on him so far. He's played 69 career games. But last year, in 47 games with the Reds, he hit 330 with 5 home runs and 15 RBIs. And I feel like the Reds, especially with the Cardinals losing Pujols and the Brewers losing Prince Fielder, could really be a a legitimate contender this year. So moving on from some of these guys is all right because you got Matt Latos. So when I saw that, and Matt Latos is still very young, he's shown a lot. And when I saw that they got him, I said, you know, it really doesn't matter what they gave up because they're getting a young guy who I think is ace material. But then I see they gave up Edison Volquez, who I'm not sure what his career ultimately is going to end up being. We'll get to him more later in this video. But Yonder Alonso, when I was told about him from uh, Reds fan Coop, who's here on YouTube, 
He's a big Reds fan. He said, try and get an interview with this guy, which I did. It didn't work out. But uh, try and get an interview because he could be one of the next big guys. And looking at what he's done, I did get to see a little bit of him over the last uh, few seasons, late in the season. I think that he could be a very important piece for this team over the next few seasons. And I really, they did a tremendous job getting pieces for Matt Lato. So that's what a team like this is going to have to do to ultimately be successful. They made a lot of nice trades and a lot of nice signings over the last few years that put them in a position that in a few years I think they will be a contender. Orlando Hudson at second base is a guy, and you also have guys like Mark Hotze over at first base and Blanks. But uh, Orlando Hudson, the O-Dog, finally kind of settled in with the team last year after signing a two-year deal. Uh, before that, he had spent a season, uh, four seasons in Toronto, three seasons in Arizona, a season with the Dodgers, a season with the Twins. He had kind of bounced all over the place, really been a solid catcher, for, or not catcher, solid second baseman for a lot of these teams. His numbers have gone down a bit, though. Last year, in his first year, he had 246 with 7 home runs and 43 RBIs, and he's getting paid to do better than that, and he's a better overall player. What I did like is that he used the base paths more, stole a career-high 19 bases last year, only got caught three times, so that is a pretty solid success rate. So the old dog, I, was, I think that this guy, and part of the reason he struggled last year is because of his inability to stay healthy. But if you go through the amount of games throughout his career. That's kind of been a reoccurring theme since he's left the Diamondbacks. His last year with the Diamondbacks, he played 107 games. Before that, or after that, he played 149 one year with the Dodgers. It's a nice number, but it's still not where it needs to be. And he played 126 with the Twins and 119 last year. So expecting this guy to play 162 games a season probably is not realistic. But hopefully when he's out there, which is has to be higher than 119 games. He's able to have more success this season than he did last year. Backing him up, you have Logan Forth's, uh Hopefully, I'm saying that right. 213 average, zero home runs, and 12 RBIs last season. He's very young, and ultimately will probably be the predecessor to Orlando Hudson, whose deal's up at the end of this season. If they're not in contention, maybe Hudson gets traded, and they give Forth the chance to play there long term. At shortstop, you have Jason Bartlett, who is not known necessarily for his hitting throughout his career, although he has had some seasons where he's hit 14 home runs with the Rays. But he is an extremely, and I mean, 2009, he had a tremendous season, 320, 14 home runs. But for the most part for this guy, and over the past two seasons, he had 254 and 245. But you would think an average in the 260s or 270s is a lot more reasonable, uh, and an expectation in San Diego of about five home runs is probably the most likely thing you're going to get. Going there is not necessarily going to be a place where hitters are going to thrive, but he is a tremendous fielding shortstop, and that is an important asset to your team. Shortstop, to me, is the most important position in the field. Backing him up, then, you have Andy Perino. Perino last season, as my computer loads this uh, up, Last season in 24 games, will hit 182 with four RBIs. I mean, obviously, he, he's the backup for a reason. He's not a starter. He's an all right player, but he doesn't do much for it. Chase Headley over at third base has actually turned into a pretty solid player, although he has never lived up to the original expectations that he had, which was one of these guys they viewed as a top prospect. They also thought coming up he might be a left fielder. He's turned into their everyday third baseman last year. Hit a career high, 289. His power numbers went from hitting 12 or 11 home runs in 2009 and 2010 to only hitting 4. And as those power numbers go down, your RBI totals are probably going to go down too. In 2009, he hit 64 RBIs. 2010, he hit 56 RBIs. And then last season, or 58. And then last season, he hit only 44. So... I would assume that the power numbers will go up. I would expect eight or nine home runs this year from Chase Headley, who should be right in his prime at age 28. And then Forrest will also back him up over there. You have Perino and Darnell as some other options over at third base. As we look towards the outfield now, you have Carlos Quinn in left field. And Quinn, I think, I, I don't know what to expect with him moving from... U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago, which is one of the best hitters, 
ballparks in the MLB, especially when the wind is blowing the right way. We know that with Chicago. You don't need to see it with U.S. Cellular because everyone's seen it with Wrigley Field for the last 100 seasons. He's hit 36 home runs before, but if in certain seasons, I mean, last year he had a, in limited time, 118 games, he had 24 home runs. He has big league power, but a lot of guys do that. Adrian Gonzalez has really been the only exception of a guy who's just continued to, th and I don't think he thrived, I'm not going to say that he thrived while he was in there. He thrived despite being in that stadium and because he's just that good. Carlos Quinn, I think a realistic expectation if he's able to play 162 games, which over his career has not happened. The most he ever played was 130 in 2008. And when you play 130 games and hit 36 home runs and 100 RBIs and hit 280, that that is a pretty solid season. But over the past three seasons, his numbers have gone down. 2009, he hit or played 99 games. 2010, it went back up one game. He played 131. And then 2011, he played 118. When he's in there, he is productive. There's no question. He'll hit you 25 home runs, or at least that's how it went when he was with the White Sox. I'm going to guess that he's going to hit about 20 to 25 home runs this year. I think he is a nice pickup for them. They didn't give up a massive amount. And I look for him to be a, a all-star candidate because, you know, there's not necessarily a guy that stands out on this team as an all-star candidate. So Carlos Quinn may be that guy. They have another. They have a few other options. Backing up Quinn will be Kyle Banks out in left field. In 55 games last year, he had 229 with 7 home runs and 26 RBIs, so he is a solid backup. He had 10 home runs in 54 games in his rookie season of 2009, so I like him a lot as a backup. You also see him get some looks potentially in right field, too. In center field, you have Cameron Maven. Obviously, he was a standout prospect with the Tigers. He was the huge piece traded to the Ti or to the Marlins in the trade that sent Miguel Cabrera and uh, Dontrell Willis. Which, and I mean, that trade didn't work out in the Willis sense. But in terms of getting Miguel Cabrera, who's still very young, under age 30, and is one of the best hitters we've seen over the past 20 years in the game of baseball, and I really don't understand why he doesn't get more love, but I'm getting off track. The, the Marlins in that trade got uh, that pitcher, Andy something, who turned out to be nothing, and they got Cameron Maven, who... For them, they just kind of rushed him to the big leagues and ultimately gave up on him. Traded him last year to the Padres, and he had a career season batting 264 with nine home runs and 40 RBIs. And again, playing in that stadium kind of knocks your numbers down a little bit. But I'll tell you, Cameron Maben really did have a very nice season last year for the San Diego Padres. Backing him up and also starting in right field will be Will Venable. Will Venable's been in the league for now four seasons. He's going to give you an average around 250 with about 10 home runs. So he's done a pretty decent job. Hopefully he, and this is a theme for a lot of the Padres, can stay out there and stay healthy, something he has had trouble doing. And then backing him up in right field is the veteran Mark Hotze, who we've seen with teams like the A's, Red Sox, White Sox, pretty much everywhere around the MLB. He's been in the league forever, even at a stint with the uh, Padres back in the early 2000s came up the Marlins he's been all around the MLB really and over uh, last season he's with the Brewers in 104 games for them he, them he had three home runs hit 270 I mean back in 2004 and 2005 he was hitting you a solid 15 home runs and he even hit 314 the one year he's a bench player at this point but I like that uh, they brought him in there. He's a veteran leader, which should help a lot of the younger guys on this team. I mean, even Cameron Maben, even though he's been in the league technically for three or four seasons now, Cameron Maben is only 25 year, 24 years old right now. He'll be 25 as the season begins. So he has certainly not reached his potential. But Mark Hatze can help him do that. He can help out and push guys like Will Venable. And bringing in leadership like Carlos Quinn, who's been in the thick of a pennant race, and Will Venable... It's really going to help and wear off on a lot of these young guys. And even Orlando Hudson was with the Dodgers when they were making a run and the Twins the other year when they were making a run. So uh, I like both of those, uh, or all three of those, I should say, additions onto this team. Let me 
open up their pitching staff real quick, which will be led by Tim Stauffer after trading away um, Matt Latos in the offseason, who had had some very good success in his first few seasons with them. Uh, Stauffer will become the ace of this rotation. Last season, Stauffer went... 9-12 and 12 with the 373 ER, and that's the type of thing about playing in a huge stadium like this, and that's what I said when the Mariners traded away uh, Michael Pineda, is you need to put more of an emphasis on hitting, and that's what they did by trading away Matt Latos, and they got a pitcher back with Edison Volquez, who is certainly going to help them and be in that rotation this year, assuming he can stay healthy. But what they also got is that they got a guy who can really... Uh, hit and that's what is going to be tough to find you can bring a lot of pitchers especially fly ball pitchers who don't work out in places like Yankee Stadium or Coors Field and you can bring them in to San Diego and their ERA can go from four and a half to three and a half which is good enough to help this team if they're able to get a solid lineup and Tim Stauffer doesn't blow you away, but he's 9 and 12 with the 373 ER, and the same goes for Seattle. You can trade, you can keep Michael Pineda, who's going to be probably a really, really good pitcher, potentially ace material, but you need hitters, and you're not going to be able to attract them any other way but trading for them. And you can bring in some other young pitchers and sign some veterans and have them come in and still give you some quality innings. And be successful for your team. Last year, you pitched in 185 innings. You would like to see him as the ace get up to 200 innings this season. At the number two spot, then, you have Clayton Richard begin his career with the White Sox, but he has really settled down with the Padres, and this is exactly what I'm talking about, the effect of going to Petco Park. He had a 441 ERA uh, in his first season, in which he played half the season with the White Sox and half with the Padres, and then he gets traded to the Padres, and he goes 14-9 with a 3.75 ERA. 3.75 ERA isn't going to win you the Cy Young, but when you throw over 200 innings and you're able to have a 3.75 ERA in 2010, win fi almost 15 games, it's a pretty solid season. You know, he's he's getting the job done. It's not great. It's a little bit above average and. You know, right now, that's probably what the best of Potters are going to do. In 2011, and then last year, he had some trouble staying healthy. He went 5-9, 388 ERA. As long as he can keep his ERA above or below 4, I mean, you got to understand that Clayton Richard is Clayton Richard. He's not going to give you a whole lot better than 4. And he shouldn't be a number 2 starter, but he is by almost default here. And they need to continue to have the expectations of Clayton Richard not a number two starter, if that makes sense. At the number three spot in their rotation, they have Dustin Mosley. Dustin Mosley last year went three and ten, but it lie or no, my bad. Yeah, three and ten, but that lies because he had a three thirty ERA in twenty games. He really did a solid job for this team. And that's why I say when people say, Oh well, CC Sabathia is gonna win the most games, so he should win the Cy Young I take a lot more stock into the ERA, in the innings pitch, the strikeouts, the whip, because he had a very low whip last year at 128. Because you can go for, play for a team and pitch very well, but if they don't score a ton of runs for you, and it's not just playing on a team like this. Like If you look at Cole Hamels a few years ago with the Phillies, he pitched very well, but he was coming off a bad season in which he was, I believe, 8-11 and 11 or something, and he ended up only going like 11-11 and 10 and everyone said oh well this is what he is now but if you actually watch some of those games you realize they just weren't hitting for him it wasn't that he had a bad season for the second year in a row and then last year obviously things got figured out and you would hope that that will be the type of thing that happens for Dustin Mosley this year Mosley hopefully can keep an ERA around where he was and he could potentially end up being one of the better pitchers for this team he is 31 years old and yeah, or no he, he just turned 30 my bad He's 30 years old and really looks to have another solid three or four seasons with the Padres if he can continue to pitch the way that he did last year. In the number four spot, you have Corey Lubke, who was my uh, Rookie of the Year pick last year. Uh, got some chances to start, but for the most part came out of the bullpen. In 
Uh, 17 starts, 46 total games. He went 6 and 10 with a 3.29 ERA. But they uh, have announced that he will be starting this season, and I'm excited to see what he can do over a full season. He is a solid 26 years old, or just turned 27 actually, and he has been touted throughout the Padres minor league system. And I would expect that he can give you a season in the area of winning you 13 games. And having an ERA around 360, which will be a pretty solid first season as a starter for Corey Lupke. At the number five position, you have Edison Volquez, who obviously got traded there in the Matt Latos trade. Edison Volquez, in his career, was a big prospect coming up the Rangers. Didn't show a ton in the limited amount of time that he got there. But then ultimately was traded for Josh Hamilton, who we know that worked out for the Rangers. In his first season with the Reds, he looked like he was going to be one of the next huge starters. In 32 starts that year, he went 17 and 6, had a 3.21 ERA, a 1.33 WHIP, and I mean, he looked like he was going to be a legit ace in the MLB. And him and Johnny Cueto were going to be one of the next big duos. And while Cueto's gone up, Volquez has had problems staying healthy, problems with uh, failed drug tests, which I believe actually was something with. Him and his wife trying to get pregnant, some deal like that. It was strange, but I think the point is that Edison Volquez still has some nasty stuff if he can get it together and stay healthy. He's still a young pitcher. He's still only 28 years old. He'll be 29 this summer. So if this works out and Yonder Alonso turns out to be good, even if Matt Latos excels the way I expect him to over in Cincinnati, you got to look at this trade and say, you know what, nice job, Padres, on getting back not only a guy like Yonder Alonso, but taking a risk on an Edison Volquez who over the past few years, the lowest, past three seasons, the lowest ERA he's had is 431. But you looked at that 2008 season, saw that this guy had something, and you can get it back. And he is a candidate for comeback player of the year, and I think that potentially he could win that award this season. We look over to the bullpen now. Houston Street obviously will be leading the bullpen. And then you have guys like Joe Thatcher in the bullpen. You have Luke Gregerson. It looks actually to be a pretty solid bullpen this year for the Padres. Joe Thatcher last year was one of the more... <coughs> Excuse me. Last season, or two seasons ago, I should say, did a tremendous job with the 129 ERA, 280 in the season before, and then 2011, he really struggled with a 450 ERA, but he had trouble staying healthy and only pitched 18 games. I think that if he can come back and be healthy this year, then they are in a pretty good situation. And as far as Luke Gregerson goes last year, he had a 275 ERA, a 3 and 3 record, and record really is irrelevant for them. He did. He is not a closer, though. They tried to put him into that role a few times. He was 0 for 4 in save opportunities. But now that they have Houston Street, assuming he can stay healthy, which is kind of uh, making an assumption I probably should not make, but assuming he can stay healthy, I think Houston Street should get, uh, if there's 60 save opportunities, he'll be getting 55 of them. I mean, even last year, Houston Street went 1 and 4, 386 ERA, 62 games, was 29 of 33 for save opportunities. I look back at 2009 when he was 35 for 37. The Rockies made the playoffs that year. Ultimately ended up losing in the first round. But he had a tremendous season that year in 61 op or 61 innings, 35 to 37, 306 ERA. He's not going to be a top five closer, I don't think. But he is a good closer and. You know, again, why overpay for a closer in a situation where you're probably not in a contention situation this year? Ultimately, I think Houston Street may be the long-term opportun long-term guy for them, and I, I think that he still has some potential to improve. But I'm going to assume right now that he has a good season. I think if you give him 35 opportunities, you can expect 31 saves. I think that's what the realistic expectation for him is. And I think that he will have a nice season this year for the Padres. And that is essentially your Padres preview as we look through their lineup. I think that this is going to be a year for the Padres where we see a lot of things. Guys like Edison Volquez, what do they do for you in the future? Yonder Alonso, what does he do for you in the future? Jesus Guzman over at first base. Nick Hundley behind the plate. 
There's a lot of overall potential. Cameron Maben in center. What is Carlos Quinton going to be long term in left field as they try and get him an extension? Maybe, hopefully not for them, he could potentially be a piece that they decide to flip again at the deadline if they can't get an extension. The Padres are doing a really nice job, though, recouping young talent for these players they're trading away. And you still have the Adrian Gonzalez trade where we are yet to see a lot of the young guys come up from that trade. So the Padres have a bright future over the next four or five seasons. They won 71 and 91 last year. I think that they're going to be good for about 74 or 75 wins this season. Bud Black has done a tremendous job as the manager of that team, and I think he is the right guy to help turn that situation around. I'm Tim. Tomorrow we will give you the Chicago Cubs preview, then the Royals, the Pirates. Let me just read off of the next five or six days or so. Royals, Pirates, the Marlins, Day 9, very interesting. The Rockies, Day 10, the A's, Day 11, Day 12, you got the Mets, Day 13, Reds, Day 14, White Sox, you got the Nationals, Indians, Blue Jays, Dodgers, that's uh, up to Day 18, Giants, and Day 20 is the Angels. So, you know, in a week we're talking about previewing some of these legitimate contenders, and who knows? Some of the teams that I previewed in these first five days, maybe one of them comes out with a huge season this year and really turns away expectations because we all know two years ago with the Padres, no one was expecting them to go 90-72. and 72. They looked at them and said, Adrian Gonzalez is going to get traded and this is going to be one of the worst teams in baseball. And ultimately that did not end up happening. It did happen last year, but not in the previous season. So, I'm Tim. Hit me up on Twitter at CashKelly underscore TRST. Hashtag deuces.